Ja, dat is het. Dat is het. I'll go through the rest of the chapter, first chapter of the precious garland and advice to the king, to a king. to the king, the text which teaches, since it teaches uh, about emptiness, so sometimes it's the title, uh, it, it, it is given another title which is called Tanya Trupa, establishing the conventional conventions. So it teaches about the causes for higher rebirth, which are the ten, avoiding the ten uh, non-virtuous actions, the morality of uh, ten non-virtuous actions, uh, avoiding the ten non-virtuous actions. And then it's, uh, there's, there are other uh, factors, which are especially mentioned here as a cause for higher rebirth, which are those given in verse number 10, not drinking intox uh, alcohol and not harming anyone at all and respectful giving to others and uh, honoring the honorable ones and so forth. Without obtaining a higher rebirth, a high status, you'll not have this kind of intelligence which will, uh, with which we are able to make distinction between what is right and wrong. And therefore, human life in general, and particularly um, in, in this life where we have this kind of a marvelous brain to um, know, think, the, the, um, the reality well, it's considered, this kind of human life is considered precious human life. And then with regard to the highest good, so of course higher rebirth is something good, something which is of a high status, but it is not beyond the, the clutches of the four, the, 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 those of the uh, suffering of conditioned existence. In other words, this kind of psychophysical aggregates that we have are under the influence of our karma and delusions. And therefore, it is a basis for suffering as well. And so it's not a, enough to accumulate merit, but we need also to over purify our negativities. The Buddha himself taught those of the, the true suffering and true origin, and then true cessation. Cessation means that the defilements, the faulty, um, qualities that we have in our minds, which actually uh, make us unruly, have this undisciplined mind, and therefore we need to know what are those uh, factors which cause us to have this undisciplined state of mind, and then apply the antidote correctly, perfectly, so that these misconceptions and the different faults of our mind, um, we will be able we will be able to see that they do not have any uh, support of uh, uh, correct knowledge and valid cognition and so forth. Therefore, we need to understand the true nature of things with wisdom and intelligence to overcome the afflictions and also the, uh, those of the uh, afflicted intelligence. 
Therefore, knowing reality and the truth goes against those of misconceptions and the mental afflictions. For example, when we look at a, an, a, a form, it appears as if it has some kind of objective existence. But when you are able to um, confirm from your own knowledge and experience that this is not how the, how the form exists, that it does not exist the way it appears. And therefore, the grasping at some kind of independent true existence of the form is actually eliminated. And therefore, to attain the higher rebirth, uh, to, to, uh, to attain this, uh, the, the highest good, the definite goodness, uh, wisdom, uh, realizing the truth and reality is very important. So with regard to the teaching of the Buddha, it is something that the more you delve into it, the, the, the more uh, convincing it becomes to you about its truth. And so scientists, of course, talk about quantum physics, and this is very compatible with the, uh, the view of uh, in, in, uh, emptiness that we, uh, the Buddhism, uh, presents. Uh, there is a song of an um, offering, puja offering, in the Chonang tradition. So this is uh, the Jonang uh, prayer of making offerings. The mirror image of illusion shows itself manifestly dubious. Awareness is clearly luminous. It all appear, disappears into the inexpressible sphere of emptiness, ablaze with great bliss. And then in your answer part, I don't remember now. In other words, it says that whatever all these appearances, so this shows that uh, the, the fact that I'm not able to recall um, these verses um, shows that I've aged. So these so these, the, the, everything that appears to us does not have any kind of intrinsic or independent existence. And all this, when you actually uh, critically analyze their nature, everything just dissolves within this emptiness or the suchness, the reality as it is, which is the uh, final or the ultimate reality of how things are. So right from the beginning, of course, things are peaceful or pacified, but things, dependently arisen things, the varieties or the myriad of dependently arisen things do appear, but when you actually analyze the final nature, everything again dissolves back into this suchness. So these, the, the peaceful nature or the peaceful or the pacified nature of everything that appears, the, the, the cloud of it appears in the sky of emptiness. But when you actually dissect these the, the clouds, everything disappears into this reality. And then with regard to the mind, of course, if you divide the mind into the three uh, times, of course, nothing can be found. And so the, the verse from the Jonang tradition 
the, uh, the mirror-like uh, image of illusions shows itself manifestly, and dubious awareness is clearly luminous, and it all disappears, because everything, when analyzed, cannot be pen... Um, we cannot point our finger at as being this or that. Everything disappears into this inexpressible sphere of emptiness. Of course, they do exist, but when you try to search for the identity, they, you, you cannot find anything as being this and that, that you can pin your, um, point your finger at. And therefore, you are ablaze with great bliss. So, of course, it can be uh, interpreted, this great bliss can be interpreted in terms of the great bliss uh, stored in the highest Yoga Tantra, but to interpret it in the common sense, so this mind which is um, tired of all these elaborations rests in peace in the forest of emptiness. So of course we do not want suffering, but we want happiness. But since time beginless, we have been inflicted with suffering because of being under the power of uh, grasping a true independent existence. And so from the peak of cyclic existence down to the uh, lowest realms of existence, so when you are able to maintain your, uh, your mind, I mean, remain in meditation on emptiness, then this could be like uh, being uh, in this, resting in this uh, great bliss. So not really uh, interpreting it in terms of the tantric the great bliss. So what actually causes misfortune to us is because of this unruly mind. So a state of mind which brings about this kind of um, restlessness in our mind uh, are called afflictions, mental afflictions, and they are rooted in ignorance or not any kind of ignorance but a misconception of reality. So when you are able to overcome this misconception, then the rest of the, not, the, the mental afflictions can be put an end to. And so 400 verses says that understanding this uh, dependent origination can put an end to our mental afflictions. And therefore, with every um, might, the uh, intelligent one should um, teach this in the beginning. So just as the, I mean, as in the, it is said in the uh, 400 verses, the, all the, um, the, the this ignorance, this, this misconception permeates all other mental afflictions, like the physical faculty uh, permeating all other faculties, such as eye faculty and so forth. And therefore, to overcome this ignorance, we need to or, um, or, um, call, um, see the reality of dependent origination. And so when Master Nagarjuna and his disciples and followers teach about emptiness, they emphasize on the, the uh, teaching dependent origination. So they can, of course, teach 
that mental afflictions can be overcome through the practice of meditation on selflessness and so forth, but they do not do say that. They emphasize the understanding of dependent origination or dependent arising because it has the significance of overcoming both the extremes at once. So through this understanding of the reality of things, dependent origination, we can achieve the highest good or definite def uh, goodness. So with regard to uh, recognizing or identifying the object to be negated when establishing emptiness, Jangya Rabe Doji says that um, people within our own system seem to talk about this object of negation, um, but uh, they still hold on to uh, some kind of solidity in things. So Jangya Rabe Doji was someone who um, wrote this text, which is called the uh, Recognizing the Face of the Mother, which is the song of experience of um, the uh, view of emptiness. So the seventh Dalai Lama also says these lines. So the, he wrote this song of uh, the view of emptiness. And in one of the texts, which is a uh, response to some questions, the seventh Dalai Lama says, in a dream, we see all kinds of um, things like horses and so forth, but they do not exist. Though things appear as if they have some kind of objective existence right there, but they do not have that kind of existence. But we should recognize there is such an appearance to this. Bad mind. So it is very important to to um, be able to know that uh, this is I mean, the, the the object to be negated. And so Changi Rabe Doji is saying that our people in our own system seem to talk about the, the object of negation, uh, but then they still hold on to something being there and solidly existing. So they are not able to actually identify the uh, object of negation. So what appears as something solid out there should be understood to be the object of negation, the appearance of the object of negation. And therefore, one should be able to uh, reject that kind of solidity in anything and confirm to yourself that nothing whatever exists the way they appear to our, your, our mind. Hmm. So as long as there is grasping at true uh, existence of the, um, the aggregates, to that extent there is grasping at true existence of a person. 
So this is an uh, important uh, verse. Verse. So verse number 35. So unless you are able to reject any uh, the objects of negation with regard to the psychophysical aggregates, you will not be able to negate uh, that of the uh, object of negation, the true existence of a person as such as well. So, with regard to selflessness, there are the course, course of understanding of it and also the subtle one. So, since the Bodhisattva on the first ground has re realized emptiness directly, it is said that they should be able to, um, though they should be able to uh, outshine those of the Ar um, Arya beings of uh, the um, Shravakayana, in particular Buddhayanas, it is not so. It is said that they are able to, and by, with, um, with intelligence, by way of their intelligence, yet until they reach the seventh ground of Bodhisattva, they are not able to do that. And so what that shows is that um, uh, they uh, do uh, realize selflessness or emptiness directly at the uh, first Bodhisattva ground, yet they are not able to outshine those of the Shravakas and Pateka Buddha, Arahats and so forth. Verse number 36 and 37 and 38. One who sees how its cause and effect are produced and destroyed does not regard the world as really existent or not really non existent. I will not read through the text. Later. At the end of the text, page, uh, which is uh, uh, verses 466 down, 20 verses. So this shows the, uh, the benefits and the advantage of bodhicitta, because this text teaches on the equal in exchanging self and others in terms of uh, in the process of developing bodhicitta. Verse number 466. So I usually recite these verses after reciting the uh, prayer called the foundation of all good qualities. And then this eight verses of uh, mind training and others. Um, so may I be beloved to sentient beings and may uh, the sentient beings be beloved to me as much as they, are, they cherish their life and so forth. And then there is this, as long as sentient beings anywhere, any sentient being anywhere has not li been liberated, may I remain in the world for the sake of that being, though I have attained my highest enlightenment. So may I be as dear to sentient beings as their own life, verse 484. Uh, before that, 483 is what His Holiness began. May I always be an object of enjoyment for all sentient beings according to their wish and without interference, as 
uh, are the earth, water, fire, wind, herbs and wild forests. May I be as dear to sentient beings as my own life and so forth. And then as long as any sentient being anywhere has not been liberated and so forth. So if you recite these lines and think about Bodhicitta, this will be helpful. And then in this text, it also deals with uh, pr demonstrating the, the Mahayana teachings as being the teaching of the Buddha as well. And so with this, this, uh, this is uh, what I've given is the essence of the precious garland. So, of course, we have the text to read, and whether you are able to actually um, make transformation within yourself by using this text and practicing it is in your hands. So, if you, it's like the being in a, a market. So you have the commodities, the things that you want to buy, in the, uh, like uh, in the uh, in a market, in these texts. But whether you buy them or not is in your hands. So these texts really uh, give great teachings. So whether you practice it or not, put them into practice or not, it's up to you. As the Buddha says, I have given you the teaching, but um, I have shown you the path to liberation, but uh, the uh, liberation is in your hands. And then masters like Nagarjuna and so forth have written their commentary treatises. And they should not just be left up in the altar for worshipping, but you should read them, not just once, but on a daily basis. Read this text and think through so that you will be able to make transformation within yourself. As the Kadamba masters have said that these conditioned things do not remain static. But um, the, since they, they undergo change, what you think, what, what you um, think may not happen to you in a hundred years, at some point will actually happen to you. So Tara Rambuji has once told me, when I told him that Bodhicitta seems to be very difficult, and uh, I told, so Tara Rambuji told me that uh, if you uh, persevere in your practice, and gradually you'll be able to have the uh, genuine experience of Bodhicitta, and he told me that he has the experience of genuine Bodhicitta. So I was feeling in the beginning that bodhicitta was something very difficult to develop, to, to uh, cultivate. But after coming into exile, I've been able to uh, study about it and contemplate on it and do meditation, persevere in the practice. And now I can, in a way, say that perhaps I have uh, 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 reached the path of accumulation of a bodhisattva, and maybe I can expect to reach the path of application, or um, but the path of seeing may be difficult yet. So in our uh, practice, there's, there is a practice of doing retreat whereby you are just confined within a room which um, within uh, four walls, without any doors, but for your meals, the, uh, you, you could be served meals through some kind of a window. So as the first Dalai Lama Gildan Trub has said, that if he had been stayed in his hermitage for a longer time, he could have reached a higher realization. Uh, 
but the purpose of developing the realization within oneself is for the benefit of others, to serve others. So whether you are able to uh, realize and uh, 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 develop a high realization or not, he has considered that secondary in comparison to serving other sentient beings. So he actually um, um, had foregone his own realization, higher realization, and uh, founded the Tashin Limbo Monastery and then engaged in teaching to others. And so I too try my best to cultivate and meditate on Bodhicitta, the purpose of which is to serve others. So I do my best to teach about the importance of the bodhicitta and the view of emptiness. So today you are here from the Dharma point of view, to talk about from the Dharma point of view, we have created this bond between of a, a spiritual teacher and a spiritual disciple. And I consider you as my brothers and sisters in the Dharma. So what I have dedicated myself to, of course, to bring all sentient beings to an enlightenment, maybe yet uh, not practical, but to serve sentient beings, the seven billion sentient beings on this earth is something that we can do practically. So I have four, three or four commitments. The first one, as a human being, one of the seven billion people on this earth, we all have the same emotionally, and physically and psychologically, we are same. So as a human being on this earth, I, as I have said before, so even from the point of view of science, since we are a social animal, and science says that basic human nature is compassionate, so through education, we need to promote the practice of compassion, love and compassion. The modern education, the so-called modern education, which originated in the West, is aimed at material development alone and not promoting inner peace. And in the West, of course, religion-wise, the, the, the religion they have is theistic religion and they pray to God. But in India, we have the techniques to transform our mind through the practices of single point of concentration, shamatha, our come abiding and vipassana, its um, special insight. And then in India, there's also the practice of secular ethics. So whether you are religious or not, believer or not, we do believe in the, um, the value of love and compassion, and therefore it should be promoted through education. So we should know what are the benefits of the practice of love and compassion for oneself and others. And so this is my first commitment to promotion of human value. So are you also not part of human beings on this earth? So all of us are part of the seven billion people. So each one of us is part of the seven billion people. Therefore, we must put effort in promoting uh, love and compassion, because it helps. We do not talk, need to talk about religion as such. So this should be part of our education curriculum. So this we can do. So the seven billion people on this earth today, 
So I've, uh, I see that uh, the education that we have so far is not adequate. But in India, we have the uh, study of mind and emotions and the practice of shamatha and vipassana for over th 3,000 years. So this is, these are Indian traditions, and therefore, since this uh, tradition of promoting and developing love and compassion has been there in Indian tradition uh, for over 3,000 years, we should take this lesson from the Indian tradition to promote love and compassion in the world. And so whether you are a believer or not, we should be able to teach people that this being kind and loving and compassionate is beneficial to oneself without touching religion but using scientific research and findings. And so this is my first commitment. And then the second commitment is as a Buddhist. I try to bring harmony amongst religions. So it's very important to have this. As I said before, of course, philosophically, they are, uh, they are different, such as those believing in Creator God and those rejecting Creator God. But the, the aim, their aim is the same, to promote love and compassion. So despite the difference in the philosophical system, all these have the purpose or the message of love and compassion. Therefore, it is very important to have religious harmony in the world. So one time in, I think in Jama Masjid in Delhi, there was a meeting of, uh, with Muslims. And so I mean, we had an interfaith uh, meeting and we visited the different uh, places of worship. And when we were in the uh, Jama Masjid, uh, I, I put on the cap, the, the Muslim cap. And next day, the picture, my picture with that hat, had actually come out in the newspapers. And I asked the Indians about their opinion, and they said that uh, people were very happy. And therefore, this is what I try to do, and you should keep this in mind. We should not cause div division amongst ourselves in the name of religion. And so as third commitment, my third commitment as a Tibetan and having the title of the Dalai Lama, all Tibetans trust me, they look up to me, and also people in the free world, Tibetans in the free world also trust me and they look up to me. And therefore I have the responsibility over the Tibetan course. But with regard to the political responsibility, since 2001 I have actually um, left it. And we have now, since then, we have had um, elected political leadership. So I usually tell people that this dual responsibility of spirituality and temporal um, power, responsibility in the Tibetan nation started since the, uh, at, during the time of the fifth Dalai Lama, and I actually stopped, see, uh, stopped this. And so if the fifth Dalai Lama were to come in vision, what would he say? I asked, but there's no danger of seeing him or his coming. So since I have left the uh, temporal 
My responsibility? My responsibility over Tibet is, on the one hand, protection of its ecology. Some Indian ecologists have told me that uh, since Tibet is in a high um, altitude, when there is some damage to the ecology, it takes more time to recover the ecology. And therefore, I tell people to preserve our ecology, that they must not damage our environment. And then, with regard to Tibetan tradition, we have the Nalanda education system, the Nalanda knowledge, which we have kept very well since this Master Shandrakshita, who came to Tibet in the 8th century, advised the Tibetans to have the teachings in Pali and Sanskrit languages into Tibetan, since you have your own writing. And he advised the Tibetans to um, study Buddhism through our own language. And therefore, the, there was the Department of Translation set up in the Samyam monastic um, compound. And so, in those days, an Indian pandita or scholar uh, worked together with a Tibetan translator to, when they translated the text. And so, most of the major classic texts uh, in Sanskrit were divided uh, and translated into Tibetan. But Sanskrit today has become a language which only a few scholars can use and no more. Uh, but Tibetan serves in lieu of Sanskrit today. So before the uh, translations were carried out into Tibetan from Sanskrit to Pali, Tibetan language was quite primitive. And as the translations were carried out, Tibetans coined new words and terms. And therefore, the Sanskrit Buddhist terms, and which were translated into Tibetan, either literally or uh, otherwise, this language, the Tibetan language, has become very rich in Buddhist um, terminology, vocabulary. And therefore, the Nalanda, the glorious Nalanda tradition, con consisting of psychology, epistemology, and logic, and so forth, are contained in our literature, in Tibetan language. So as an, as an academic subject, it doesn't belong to the Tibetans alone, but it belongs to the whole world. And therefore, we, we need to preserve and also um, recover those that have declined and preserve that the, 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 those that have not declined. And so, since Tibetan language is part of Tibetan identity, the Chinese hardliners actually see that uh, preservation of Tibetan language as a threat to the separation of Tibet from the PRC, the People's Republic of China. So, we need to, I always emphasize, the need for preserving and promoting this knowledge tradition that we have received from the Nalanda uh, monastic institution. And therefore, after coming into exile, we um, requested the Indian government at that time when Pandit Nehruji was alive. And we have Tibetan schools set up separately for Tibetan children in India with the help of the Indian government. And then also we have the monastic institutions of learning where they, uh, the, the, the monks and nuns study with this philosophy, logic and so forth. There are over 10,000 of them. 
and we have the, through these institutions we have preserved well, very well, our tradition of knowledge that has come down from the Nalanda institution. In Tibet, of course, sometimes the policy may be more lenient, at other times there are lots of restrictions and therefore Tibetans inside Tibet have great difficulty doing the preservation and the promotion of our culture and tradition. And so, having kept our tradition well, of course, the Chinese people from Taiwan and here, people who in China, the men in China, also follow the same Nalanda tradition. Tangsan Lama or Xuanzang did not know uh, the, the, the logic. Since they did not bring the text of Master Dignaga and Dharmakiti to China, you do not have the tradition of learning, studying logic and epistemology. And therefore, though we are same followers of the same Nalanda tradition, but we, of course, can give, um, uh, serve you in terms of bringing the knowledge of Nalanda through logic and uh, epistemology and so forth. And therefore it is very important for us to preserve our knowledge tradition. So of course, you, the Chinese people here, you may come into contact with China, people within the mainland China and there you should study, you should be able to um, bring to their knowledge that today Tibetan is the most, um, I mean, the best language to study with this philosophy, logic and so forth. So the Tibetans inside Tibet, of course, they keep up with the Tibetan spirit, however uh, much hardship they may be undergoing. And, and there have been, of course, there are over so many people who have actually self um, set them on fire, themselves on fire. So when people can go, go to that kind of a length, I mean, it's easy to understand that they can harm others, but they did not. So there are over 160 or, who have self-immolated inside Tibet. So they have still kept up very firmly, um, with uh, steadfast with that of the non-violence the practice of non-violence. So Tibetans are peaceful inside and outside. So of course there are bad Tibetans. So the Tibetans have this profound and the vast tradition which contains that of the practice of non-violence. And so the whole of Tibet is permeated with this practice of non-violence. And so my uh, most important uh, commitment to the Tibetan cause is to preserve this profound, deep and vast tradition of knowledge. And for that, the language Tibetan is very important. And therefore, I consider it very important to um, make people aware of this. So even the Tibetans living in other parts of the world, So it's almost 10 o'clock now. So Tibetans living abroad also teach Tibetan to their children. They are paying attention to this. 
电器的电器主管。So with regard to Buddhist philosophy, dharma and uh, logic and epistemology, Tibetan language is very important. And so the Nalanda tradition of logic, epistemology, philosophy, the psychology, when it comes to explaining about this, this language, Tibetan, is, becomes very important. So, as I said before, I have uh, seized my uh, political responsibility, but since 1974, we have um, followed the um, middle way approach for solving the Tibetan issue. To remain, which means that we remain within, to remain within the People's Republic of China. Today, I heard that uh, the Tibetans are doing well in selling Tsampa inside Tibet, and in fact, many Chinese are said to actually uh, take Tsampa. So if we could have a harmony and friendship between the Tibetan and the Chinese peoples, which I uh, suppose the mainland the China make up has over 1.3 billion, 1.3 billion or 4 billion people. And then in India, so the fourth commitment that I have is to uh, revive the ancient Indian uh, knowledge and wisdom. So India is the only country, I say, which is able to, uh, which could combine the modern education with an ancient Indian knowledge. So Mahatma Gandhiji promoted non-violence, which has been a practice in India for over a thousand years. And so this has spread through, because of him, to the rest of the to, uh, He showed the example to others. So people like Nelson Mandela, the late Nelson Mandela, Bishop Tutu, and then Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King. Yes. They followed this non-violence principle of Mahatma Gandhi. With regard to Martin Luther King, I know his uh, children. I have not met him personally, but I, also, I met his widow. So she told me that Martin Luther King was so um, call, attracted to the nonviolence principle of Mahatma Gandhi, he even wanted to dress like Mahatma Gandhi. -ji. So a black American, were he to wear Gandhi's dress, I wondered what would he look like. So the thousand-year-old tradition of non-violence was actually put into practice in the world by Mahatma Gandhi, and he set an example to the world in terms of practicing non-violence. And then, in this 21st century, the practice of karuna, or compassion, which is the practice of psychology, so if it could, if this could be combined this Indian tradition, ancient Indian tradition, could be combined with the modern knowledge of science. It would be very good, I say, to the Indians. 
also the, modern, the Western countries, which have emphasized on material development alone. I mean, people are not happy. So the in ancient Indian knowledge brings peace of mind, and the modern knowledge brings physical comfort, physical hygiene, and so forth. So there may be Indians here, but many Indians, of course, would be able to may be able to watch this live webcast. So I try to preserve or revive the ancient Indian knowledge through the secular means, not religious. So I just wish to ex uh, share these four commitments with you, my Dharma brothers and sisters, and try to be practical about this and keep these in your mind. And next we are going to do the Jenang, the Queen of Great Knowledge, the Great King Queen of Knowledge, Mayuri or Peacock. So in the text, it mentions that there may be uh, harm brought about to you by so the best means to overcome the harms that are brought about by the so-called evil beings, ghosts, and so forth, is to practice bodhicitta. As I quoted Master Shandideva's text yesterday, be joyous. Gods and non-gods, non, non be joyous. So when you practice bodhicitta, there's no one you consider as your enemy or evil being to you and so forth. So they are all sources of good for you, that you can do something good for you, for them. So usually we have the practice of uh, giving some torma offering, um, tormas or ritual cakes to drive away evil forces. But I do not do this. So there's, I don't know if we can actually expel them or not by doing this kind of ritual. But in fact, it would be better to call upon them to yourself and uh, be friends with them. So in Tibet, we did this kind of ritual to expel uh, ghosts and so forth, evil beings and so forth, to um, call uh, across the oceans. So maybe by doing that, they may have been driven to India from Tibet. So I do some ritual cake offering to what are known as the local spirit deities. So there's nobody that we can think of as being enemies to be um, dispelled and overcome. So this is a Torma offering given to the local landlord spirits. So to give the Jenang permission initiation so called, of Mayuri Vidyaraji, the peacock deity. 
Please repeat these lines of request. Out of your kindness, O exalted Lama, you who are in the nature of all Buddhas of the three times and the special meditational deity, please bestow all the Jenang permission and initiation on me. And next uh, is taking the Bodhisattva vows. So, in connection with this ritual, so, please imagine or uh, visualize uh, Buddha Shakyamuni surrounded by the seven, eight uh, Bodhisattva deities and also masters uh, are uh, Nagarjuna and so forth. And then the followers of the 17 Nalanda masters in Tibet, the followers of the different Buddhist traditions of Tibet. And then also you can imagine the masters of the past who are, were followers of Master Nagarjuna and others of India. So if you have so in order to cultivate bodhicitta, you need to practice the purification of negativities and accumulation of merit. So imagine that you are you, uh, making prostrations to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and make offerings to them in the sense that you will follow in their footsteps. Whatever intention and aspiration they have, that you will carry them out. So far, we have let ourselves be taken away, carried away by our um, ignorance, grasping a true existence and also self-cherishing attitude. But now we'll go against them and follow the footsteps uh, in the footsteps of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And then also, from the depths of your hearts, that you will rejoice in the great enlightened deeds of the past Buddhas, the Buddhas of the past, present and future. And then in front of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, so who have given us this the, um, profound teaching which is um, based on reason and logic, the philosophical views and so forth, and acknowledge your faults and rejoice in the good deeds of the past Buddhas and so forth, and request the Bud that the Buddhas stay and not pass away, but give teachings. And then dedication of all these merits to for full awakening. Please kneel on your right knee for the Bodhisattva vow. So the 
verse which says with the wish to liberate all sentient beings, free all sentient beings. So how did the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas become so sacred? They became so by practicing and cultivating bodhicitta, which holds one others more cherishing, cherishable than other, uh, oneself. And since we are dear followers, having obtained this human life and met with the teaching of the Buddha, just as they have gone through their practice, likewise, you pledge to follow in their footsteps with a wish to I take refuge in the Buddha's with the Dharma and Sangha until I reach the end such an enlightenment. Enthused by wisdom and compassion, today, in the presence of the Buddha, I shall cultivate a mind for full awakening. Please repeat. So at the end of the third repetition, so just as the past Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have cultivated Bodhicitta and engaged in the Bodhisattva practices, make your pledge that you will do so as well. And keep all the Bodhisattva vows comprising the 18 Rudan Falls and the uh, 46 secondary infractions. So you should be able to reduce self cherishing attitude as much as you can and develop a cherishing the sense of cherishing others over oneself as much as you can. So until the end of space you should dedicate yourself for benefiting others. Please repeat this with a wish to Enthused by wisdom and compassion, today I diligently, in front of the Buddhas, generate the mind for full awakening. So please sit down. Uh, so, in the tantric rituals, I've mentioned it briefly before. So, the full um, Profundity of Tantra can be found in the Guya Samacha Tantra, the highest high yoga Tantra, in which the um, Master Navajuna has taught the generation completion stages and Master Arya Deva and Chandrakirti also have written texts on, I mean, emphasize the teaching of uh, Tantra. So, of course, tantric teachings were given in 
uh, visions which happen to individual practitioners. So the, the wisdom through the body and the complete enjoyment body at the resultant state of Buddhahood and the highest yoga tantra of Goyasamaja tantra talks about the, that of the, the union state at the resultant state. For that, you need to have the course at the trainee level where you first attain the pure body and pure mind, the pure body of illusory body and then uh, pure illusory body and then pure clear lights. So these become con compatible courses for the Buddha's body. So the, the union state at the stage of normal learning must be preceded by this kind of compatible course. At the trainee level, you attain a union of the, um, the body and the mind. So in the... Uh, when you are able to make this clear light, subtlest clear light mind manifest within yourself, then the course of state of mind would cease to be active. And this kind of a subtle mind to do your practice on the basis of this, for example, the, uh, the meditation on emptiness done on the basis of the subtle mind is more powerful then doing such practice on the basis of the coarser states of mind to overcome your uh, cognitive obscurations completely. As Kunshin Lama Jayang Sheba said, though emptiness is the main uh, teaching, um, the, uh, the, called the object to be meditated on is, is taught in both Sutra and Tantra. Uh, the clear light, luminous mind is not taught in Sutrayana. Although the obscuration of con uh, uh, of um, uh, obscuration to knowledge is taught in the uh, sutra and both the sutra and tantra, the subtlest um, obscuration is not taught. The clear light mind uh, to overcome that is not taught in the sutrayana. In tantra, of course, you have the deity yoga practice where you visualize yourself transforming into a deity. So here in this case, it's not enough just to visualize, say and think that you are the great knowledge queen on a peacock. But you must be able to do this practice of deity yoga based on meditation on emptiness. So from with the, your, 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 you remain absorbed in emptiness and from within that state of emptiness you arise into a deity and while you have the appearance of a deity, your, your mind is um, ascertaining that of emptiness of the deity as well. And therefore, since the meditation on emptiness is um, part and parcel of the tantric practice, you meditate on emptiness right in the beginning and then go into the deity yoga practice. And therefore, with the regard to the objects, that there are those of the pure and impure objects. So meditating on emptiness of impure objects, I mean, uh, is less powerful than meditating on the emptiness of pure objects, such as a deity. So of course this innate luminous mind has been there right primordially. 
And so we're using these minds to realize emptiness and then during the practice is taught in the highest yoga tantra, though in the lower tantras there is meditation on emptiness and from within that state of absorption in emptiness you arise into a deity is taught. So with this mantra of Swabhava mantra, you meditate on emptiness. Om Swabhava Shuddha, Om has three letters, A, U and Ma, representing our body, speech and mind. Within that there are the pure, impure and the pure body, speech and mind. So Om represents the body, speech and mind, on the basis of which there is the designated self. And Shuddha means to be purified or pure. And Sarva Dharma means all phenomena. So all phenomena, whether pure or impure, everything is devoid of or free of from intrinsic existence, devoid of intrinsic existence. So Om Swabhava Shuddha shows that of the emptiness of self and then Sarva Dharma shows, refers to the emptiness of all phenomena such as your psychophysical aggregates. So you meditate on emptiness. So when your uh, mind is totally absorbed in emptiness, your mind is not focusing or your mind is not uh, thinking of the deity or whatever objects you are meditating emptiness of. So in the perspective of that mind, absorbed in emptiness, the deity or whatever does not appear. And when you look at me, you see Dalai Lama, but my body, speech and mind are not me although there are my body, speech and mind. And when I look at you, as the seventh Dalai Lama says, in this crossroad, at the crossroad of the six perceptions, there are, there are these hazy appearances, but do not consider them as being real. So, of course, there are many different people here, Chinese monks, nuns, lay people, from, and lay people and others from different parts of the world and so forth. But when you actually search for their real identity, you cannot find them being this or that. so we are at the crossroads of the six perceptions of diverse appearances are seen the hazy dualistic phenomena which are baseless there is no magical there is a magical show which is by nature deceptive don't believe in it to be true but view it as having the nature of emptiness so meditate on emptiness here don't let your mind go astray, but place it in the nature of appearance and emptiness. Through not losing mindfulness, hold it in the nature of appearance and emptiness. And so, from within that state of emptiness that you are meditating on, visualize yourself transforming into this Mahamayuri Vidyarajani deity. 
，我自己就有条件，冇钱就住，当家求学，要不然我去没有学，娘下头讲了不买，呃，给人弄个套了都是这种，人工钱钱弄出几千万。So this deity is green in color, with the central face green, right face uh, black, or and left face white, and so on. So you have three faces and six arms. Every face has three eyes. Your central face is green, right face black, and left face white. In your upper right hand, you hold a peacock feather. In your middle right hand, an arrow. In the lower right hand, in the lower right hand, you hold it in the gesture of supreme spiritual feet, bestowed. In your left, upper left hand, you hold precious tail whisk. In the middle, left hand, hold a bow. And top, um, on top of your lower left hand, you hold a vase. Please repeat this. Om Mahamayuri. Vyaranza. Hum Hum Pepe. Om Mahamayuri. Vyaranza. Hum Hum Pepe. Om Maha Mayuri. Vyaranza. Hum Hum Pepe. Please help these disciples to attain enlightenment. Please exert your guardian influence on them. From now on, please act as their spiritual special meditation deity. Please help them to attain the, all the tantric realization of the steadfast discipline of the yogi. So this deity, the practice of this deity, is quite prevalent in um, widespread in China. So the main practice that you should focus on when doing this practice of uh, this deity, Mahamayuri, is bodhicitta and the wisdom of emptiness. So you should, while visualizing yourself as Mahamayuri with the Arajani, um, you should meditate on and cultivate bodhicitta and the wisdom of emptiness as your main practice. So imagine that all you receive all the blessings of Mahamayuri Vidya Rajani, this great peak of deity of knowledge. So with this, we have done the Jinam, permission initiation of the Mahamayuri Vidyarajani, Peacock Deity. So for these three days, we have engaged in the teaching of the precious garland as the main teaching. I didn't feel exhausted. I hope this teaching would be of some benefit to you. So I do lots of daily yoga practice, such as Kuya Samacha, Yamantaka, and Heruka. 
Ya Baja Yogini, Kurukule, and Sinulani, Evajra, and others. But mainly, my main practice is bodhicitta and the wisdom of emptiness. So when I teach I and mean, practice on bodhicitta and teach to others, sometimes I even dream of talking about bodhicitta to others. As soon as I wake up, I recall the Buddha, Shakyamuni, and meditate on bodhicitta and emptiness. So, although there are lots of daily yoga practices I, I do, these two, bodhicitta and the view of emptiness, are my main practices, as my dharma friends of course, I am your teacher or guru. So since Master Shandi Deva became our teacher, we have actually followed in his footsteps with much dedication. And therefore, as my disciples, please try to be uh, train yourself in the footsteps of your teacher. Chi 
祈愿人云成般起教持空心刹土集，十定中还现空了白之之。